Thanks. All right, very, very good. So, uh, our last uh, speaker uh, of this uh, conference and this session is uh, Professor Otto. You can speak on animal diffusion. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be at Alexis' uh, uh, birthday conference uh, uh, and to celebrate his work and the work of the uh, larger community. And uh, it's a pleasure, that it's, it's a great uh, joy that this takes place at our institute. I think it's also a little bit uh, a welcoming part of this welcoming uh, 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 events for, uh, for Laszlo as a, as a director here at the uh, Max Planck Institute. Um, so uh, Alexi and I, uh, I think, I mean, we never, while well, we never worked together, I think we had early on, we had kind of mathematical encounters, so to say, in my PhD thesis. Uh, 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 roughly speaking, I uh, kind of brought together the bardos lohu nedelec boundary condition with Khrushchev's uh, uh, one-based uh, one theory. I needed, uh, uh, I needed to use the fact the pretty obvious fact that uh, vector fields which have a divergence that is a measure allow for a normal trace in a weak sense. And then Alexi proved that uh, for uh, nonlinear, thanks to nonlinearity, uh, you in fact have strong traces and he used blow up arguments. And then later on in, uh, in work with um, <coughs> Camilo de Lelis and Michael Westickenberg, we used blow up to, uh, in a certain sense, go a step further by showing that uh, the, uh, even if you don't have a BV uh, estimate, uh, the structure of uh, uh, generally nonlinear scalar conservation laws is such that you have a rectifiable, a rectifiability of the jump set and traces uh, along the jump set uh, on either side. Uh, so that's one, uh, one, one story. Another story, I, don't, uh, I, I, still, I still would like to see whether there is a connection between uh, what Alexi and, uh, uh, and Léger did uh, in terms of uh, kind of L2 contraction and something I did on uh, in the context of the kuramoto shivashinsky equation, but I think that's not uh, that's much less clear. So uh, so there were points of contact. But uh, what I'm going to talk about here is <clears throat> I think there is not so at least no obvious uh, point of contact. So it's uh, um, <clears throat> it's on a, on a <clears throat> drift diffusion equation or drift diffusion. Process x of t in uh, d-dimensional space will be more specific in a second. Uh, so, uh, uh, using kind of the uh, notation of uh, stochastic analysis, uh, 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 there is the uh, drift term, which is given by a vector field B on R d, which is independent of time, so it's an autonomous drift. Uh, and then there is uh, the Brownian forces, so the particle is being kicked, the tracer is advected in this drift, in this velocity field, in this time-independent velocity field, and at the same time it experiences Brownian forces, and uh, like uh, Pierre Manuel, I will put uh, like any good analyst the square root of two there, and uh, let's say we start, uh, we call the starting point the origin of our space, and, uh, and we're interested in the case uh, where this drift is divergence free. So that's a very important structural assumption. And, um, <clears throat> and in a certain sense, we, I mean, we're after understanding the interaction of uh, drift and diffusion. And in a certain sense, we want to consider the most generic uh, situation of a drift and the most generic ways that you know, something, just another word of saying uh, random, and uh, in a certain sense, the most neutral way of introducing randomness is to say uh, that B essentially is white noise, vector valid white noise. But of course, that's incompatible with the assumption that you have something that's divergence free. So you take the Lorentz projection of white noise. And uh, for the moment, this is just a fudge parameter. I put an amplitude epsilon here in the entire talk. Epsilon will not be small, but uh, it's convenient to uh, sometimes think of it as being small. But uh, so therefore, the letter epsilon uh, at the moment, it's just an amplitude. So more precisely, uh, B is um, 
uh, stationary and centered Gaussian process, Gaussian field. So I put in quotation marks because it's highly irregular, so it's not a function, it's a distribution in the sense of Schwarz. <laughs> and uh, as such, describe by its uh, covariance tensor. So here it's, uh, uh, we're in the situation of vector field, so the covariance is a tensor of two realizations, oh, sorry, and here I'm this notation, uh, taking the expectation of the dyadic product of bx and dy, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, covariance is best described in terms of its Fourier transform because uh, by the nature of the covariance, this Fourier transform has to be non-negative. So F, uh, calligraphic F denotes the Fourier transform. C is the covariance tensor. K is the wave number. So that would be epsilon square times uh, the identity. And now comes what's... Uh, due to the Lorette projection, uh, this type of projection, which, is, uh, which, makes, it, uh, which makes it divergence free. So, uh, so that, is, uh, uh, that would be the, um, uh, the problem setting. And uh, so let's do a, before really embarking on the problem, let's do a dimensional analysis. So, or scaling and dimensional analysis. So I think most of us uh, are familiar with the fact that uh, Brownian motion, uh, the driving force here, has a parabolic scaling, which means that if I rescale length with a factor L, uh, that's the same thing as speeding up time with a factor L square. Uh, so we have uh, identity in law and distribution between these two objects. And the question uh, we're asking is, uh, could we have the same effect? Could we have the same diffusive behavior for X? Because after all, this action of this random drift is not so different from Brownian motion if you think about the molecular origin of Brownian motion, right? I mean, here, uh, this particle, this tracer, uh, receives a kick from the thermal forces, but at the same time as it moves, it explores kind of new regions where B is independent for, of where it was before, and uh, you know, provided you're sufficiently transient, so you explore space uh, in, a, in a good way, which you would do in high dimensions, you also experience forces which are decorrelated in time. So this should also have a diffusive effect. So it's not outrageous to ask the question, uh, is is it actually true? I mean, when uh, when would you see uh, uh, when would you see such a diffusive effect? So you may ask you may ask the question: uh, When do we have the same property uh, for uh, the solution of this uh, this equation? And uh, and then you realize that this happens if uh, the behavior of the drift in a certain sense is compatible with the parabolic rescaling, which means that if you, uh, uh, that the drift, uh, which should scale as a velocity, because this is space over time, so drift, I mean, that's velocity. I mean, we know that from fluids. So, uh, so that means if I look at it in kind of these new uh, spatial coordinates, it should behave like velocity. Uh, so velocity is rescaled like uh, space over time, so the question is, uh, so the statement is uh, that in, at least in terms of scaling, this looks reasonable if we have this scale invariance uh, for, the, for this random field drift, uh, drift field B. So let me write this as L minus one B. And, uh, but then it's well known that uh, for our choice of B, we know how, we know this law, So we know that this behaves like L 
minus dimension over two, which is the typical white noise or central limit theorem scaling of B. So that's the scaling law we actually have for this choice of a drift. And this is the scaling law we need in order for the drift to behave like a diffusion. And now you see that the most interesting case is the two-dimensional case. So the question is, uh, in the two-dimensional case, do we just see an enhanced diffusion due to the presence of this random drift? And if it were that easy, you know, I wouldn't give, I would be, I would not be giving this talk. And the first problem you you encounter is that, in fact, this equation uh, doesn't really have a sense because the drift, which after all has the regularity of white noise in two dimensions, is borderline too rough. So, uh, because B, the realizations of B are not in, not even in C minus one. C minus one would be kind of the critical space for giving a sense to such a, uh, such, a drift, uh, uh, such a drift diffusion equation, and it's borderline not the case. So the, uh, Hölder, on the Hölder scale, uh, white noise in two space dimensions is marginally worse than C minus one. So in fact, this equation is, is ill-posed, and the physicists were aware of this. And now the standard fix is to introduce some cutoff to make it well-posed. So uh, that motivates to introduce a small scale, so ultraviolet cutoff. And that, of course, can be very easily implemented by doing that on Fourier space, since anyway, it's natural to work with Fourier space. So we just uh, cut it off uh, whenever uh, wave number is larger or equal to one and keep the rest. Of course, one could also take a kind of a smoother cutoff in Fourier space, but it doesn't really matter for the purpose of what we're doing. And, uh, and so, the, so here I'm making a choice of scales. I'm choosing my scales so that the microscopic scale, the cutoff scale, is unity. That's a choice. I could also use drama and call it delta, but uh, I don't like that. So. That means that now <clears throat> this epsilon square uh, now becomes a kind of a relevant non-dimensional number because I've, in a certain sense, fixed my scales. And epsilon square can be interpreted as a Pickley number. And as many of you know, Pickley numbers, in a certain sense, um, uh, so this Pickley number rises from the ratio of two length scales. One length scale is the length scale which is given by kind of comparing diffusion and convection or drift and diffusion. And the other length scale is uh, the correlation length, the cutoff scale of this randomness. And the ratio of these two scales uh, kind of give you the Pickley number. And again, uh, we call it epsilon or epsilon square, but you shouldn't think of it as being small. Okay. so. Uh, so, but then in line, <clears throat> in line with the fact that you introduced a small scale cutoff, uh, you should ask the question about asymptotic behavior, time asymptotic behavior. So, uh, Because the small time behavior now is completely governed by this non-universal cutoff. So uh, the right question to ask, the right question where you could you know, ex expect to in infer something universal is or interesting ph phenomenon is now to ask a large scale or a large time question. And of course, what's very natural from, uh, from the point of view of this field is to monitor the, what is called Annealed second moment. So, oops, you look at uh, your process, 
You look at it in, along a certain spatial direction. Uh, which I will normalize equal to one. Uh, you look at the square of it, and then you take the expectation, and the expectation is with respect to both uh, the Brownian noise and the quenched, the environmental noise, the noise which comes from B. And this is why the reason, uh, the reason for the naming Neil comes from the fact that you take the expectation with respect to both ensembles, kind of the Brownian forces and the environment, uh, uh, the ensemble of the environment. So this is just language, Neil. And now the question is, uh, does it, so does it behave like, uh, so 2T would be like purely, if epsilon is equal to zero, it would behave like 2T because of our square root of two. And uh, so the question is, does it behave simply in the sense that we add to the two? And the answer is no. So it's not a diffusive behavior. So no, and in fact, uh, so the physicists, uh, so I think the earliest work we could find is by PRL, by uh, Fisher and collaborators from 85. They gave um, a PRL, I mean, you know, those four page papers, so very condensed uh, 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 renormalization group argument, uh, formal, but uh, very convincing that in fact, uh, this quantity should scale like T, the square root of a logarithm. Mm -hmm. So not surprisingly, in a situation that's critical, you would expect logarithms to appear. And, uh, and you know, typically when, uh, when logarithms appear, you know, you typically have also, you know, people will not be surprised that it's rather the square root of a logarithm that appears. But that was their prediction. And of course, that uh, kind of calls for mathematicians to uh, think about this. And uh, <clears throat> so there was uh, the first rigorous work in that direction was, I think, 14 or 12 by Balintot and Michael. And they proved. Uh, suboptimal upper bound, uh, but more importantly, they prove the lower bound, which shows that indeed it behaves, there is an, an anomalous diffusion in the sense that it's faster uh, than, than diffusion. I think there is no square root. So, uh, but uh, kind of, in a certain sense, not capturing the right scaling because, you know, there's some room between a, a logarithm and a double logarithm. And but then and they introduced a, they used a technique which is um, kind of in a certain sense very in the math physics style of uh, understanding kind of this ensemble spanned uh, by 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 the Gaussian noise in terms of uh, a Fox space and uh, 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 in fact an analysis which. Uh, in recent years has been applied to uh, different types of problems, but also to this one. And so this analysis was, or this approach was refined recently by <coughs> Kanizao, uh, Haunstein, Haun, Schmidt, WT, Siebitz, and Toninelli. So that was published 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 last year but probably around for longer and they proved that uh, uh, the same quantity uh, has up to a double logarithm the scaling so that's already uh, uh, very good it's almost uh, uh, the optimal result, uh, but it's still, you know, it's a double log logarithm away from the scaling. And uh, now recently with uh, 
uh, with uh, Georgiana Shetsi Giorgio, who is there in the audience. Peter Morphy, who is an NSF postdoc here in Leipzig. Lihan Wang, who is a postdoc here but on his way to CMU, and myself. So we posted it at the end of 22. Uh, we proved, in fact, uh, the following sharper statement. So, where am I going to state it? Oops. It's here. So, for any epsilon, there exists a constant C epsilon, which is positive and finite. So that if T is uh, larger than one, uh, then Only quantity two times t square root of one plus uh, epsilon square over two logarithm t is sandwiched by e epsilon and one over c epsilon. And uh, if epsilon is small, so in the small Peclet number regime, we get the right asymptotics. Let me squeeze this here. C epsilon is equal to one plus something of the order of epsilon for epsilon small. So uh, we get uh, we get the right scaling for any uh, size of the Pickley number, but we get kind of the right constant asymptotically in the regime of small Pickley number. And of course, it would be interesting to understand the large Pickley number regime also in terms of the prefactor, not just in terms of the scale. And uh, now this might be more like a pissing contest, so getting rid of a double logarithm. But I think what's interesting is that uh, we use a kind of a completely different uh, um, uh, different uh, technique, uh, which in fact is, I mean, a strategy which was laid out laid out much uh, a long time ago by uh, the school around uh, George Papa Nicolau. So. Let me. In fact, we're following a strategy which was uh, proposed by a collaborator of uh, Papa Nicolau, Albert van Young. Mm -hmm. And let me uh, kind of tell you the strategy we're using. Uh, which was laid out in this paper. And so those are kind of, that's the applied math community or applied analysis community. So, so, so that was a kind of paper without proofs, but interesting ideas. Uh, so he suggested to uh, also introduce uh, not just a um, small scale cutoff, but uh, uh, a large scale cutoff. So infrared cutoff. L, so L should be much larger than one, but less than infinity and consider uh, the uh, uh, covariance function uh, where I take away not just the, uh, the very small scales, meaning the large wave numbers, but I also take out the very small, extremely small wave numbers, which correspond to extremely large scales. And uh, uh, in this situation, uh, it is known, and I will say something about it in a second, that in this situation, uh, you don't have anomalous diffusion. So if you look uh, at the limit of uh, your second moments divided by what they would be in case of bare diffusivity, this limit exists. <coughs> 
Well, in fact, it's always larger than their diffusivity. And uh, let's give it a name. Some uh, effective diffusivity lambda L. And, uh, uh, and so he said, you know, one has to understand how this effective diffusivity scales in the large scale cutoff. Our lambda scales in lambda L, and that's exactly what we proved. So this, in a certain sense, is a little bit of a post-processing of the uh, following theorem. Prime, where we show that lambda L, um, lambda, L oops, lambda L divided by, what is it, 1 plus epsilon uh, logarithm of L is bounded by C epsilon squared and one of the C epsilon squared, the same C epsilon. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so we, we monitor how this effective diffusivity, this not anomalous diffusivity, diverges logarithmically, or more precisely, like the square root of the logarithm, as you let this uh, artificial uh, large-scale cutoff go to infinity. And so capturing exactly this, not surprisingly, uh, uh, capturing uh, capturing this um, uh, this asymptotics is uh, related to capturing this asymptotics. It's just uh, uh, I mean, just memographically, what you do, of course, uh, uh, um, there's a square here, uh, and then I'm, I don't know. Yeah, then there's no square root, and then yeah, okay, so. Let me write it. Um, so uh, no squares at all. Uh, so uh, and then and then you say that uh, this diffusivity is relevant uh, for time scales which are of the order of uh, L square, and uh, and this way you uh, um, you pass from uh, from one to the other. Mm -hmm. so question: yeah. Can you think about this as a thermodynamic limit? Well, in, in a certain sense, it, I mean, if you would think about it as a thermodynamic limit, it wouldn't work because you, you get infinite diffusivity in the infinite size system. Mm -hmm. But uh, but you're right. In, I mean, instead of uh, kind of considering a cutoff which comes from, uh, you know, from doing this, you could as well go to uh, kind of a torus with a large period L mm -hmm. and then the result presumably and the statement would be the same and then it would look like a thermodynamic limit but then in a certain sense it's a thermodynamic limit where the quantity you're interested in diverges as opposed to standard thermodynamic limits where you want to show that things behave in an extensive way and it can pass to the uh, to the limit okay so now how do we prove this and i mean how does fan yang uh, suggests to prove this uh, by uh, homogenization. And uh, so let me say a couple of words about this. This here. So it perfectly, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the cutoff, it perfectly fits kind of the standard framework of homogenization or uh, stochastic homogenization, and that was exactly what uh, Fan Yang and uh, Papa Nicolaou had worked on. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so you can rephrase this question as a homogenization question, as I'm going to explain. <coughs> and that's related, or what kind of makes that convenient is that. Uh, uh, one can rewrite the generator. So let's look at the generator. So let's now kind of move to PDE. So, consider generator of Earth diffusion process. And I'm thinking of the, uh, now the forward, way of writing the generator. It doesn't really make a big difference because the drift is divergence-free, but still, 
that's the way I would like to think about it. So that's minus the Laplacian, which comes from the bare diffusion, plus the divergence of uh, uh, u times b. And since we're in two space dimensions, uh, this uh, divergence-free drift can be written as the rotated gradient of a stream function. So J will be always this rotation matrix by 90 degree. And uh, then there is kind of an old trick that you can write this here as the divergence of the identity plus psi times J <coughs> applied to the gradient of U. So in other words, you have kind of a plain elliptic second order equation in divergence form. And, uh, um, and clearly, because this matrix is Q, uh, it's uniformly elliptic. I mean, its lower bound is 1. Just its upper bound may be large because there's the psi. I mean, the upper bound also sees the off-diagonal part. But, uh, um, uh, but it's clearly uh, an elliptic problem, perhaps not uni or generally non-uniformly bounded because we're looking at Gaussian fields. And um, so why am I mentioning this? Uh, because it, it's actually convenient now to think in terms of the stream function. Uh, because this is, in fact, how uh, these people were thinking about the problem in the first place. Uh, so what do we know about the, uh, about the stream function? So the ensemble of uh, the stream function psi is nothing else than epsilon times the Gaussian free field. with uh, cutoff both at uh, uh, ultraviolet and at infrared. And so let's write down the covariance function for the stream function. So let me use the same letter. Cx minus y is psi x psi y. Now, this is a scalar quantity, and what we have is that uh, um, the Fourier transform of this is, has exactly the same uh, prefactor as what I wrote down here. So there is the cutoff uh, at very large scales and very small scales. There is the epsilon square, and then there is k minus 2, which is the... Uh, Power law of the yeah. Can you comment a little bit on the fact that the drift becomes part of the diffusion? I did not. I don't know the usual the classical trick. Uh, so that's in a certain sense, it's vector cal vector calculus, and it's kind of a consequence of d square equal to zero. It's uh, it's nothing deep, but if I do it now on the blackboard, it, it's going to mess up. It's going to be messed up, but. Uh, um, uh, so let me leave it uh, leave it like this. I, and I, if you want, I, we can do the calculation together later. So, um, uh, so in a certain sense, we can forget about the drift B, and we can think about uh, uh, this type of elliptic operator with a random coefficient, uh, uh, which is even Gaussian, and where the skew symmetric part, which is given by the stream function. So, perhaps I should make this explicit. This matrix is just one on the diagonal and minus psi psi on the off diagonals. Uh, so we have a kind of a Gaussian coefficient field that's uniformly, I mean, from the lower side, uniformly elliptic, uh, with uh, 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 with, a, with an ensemble that's uh, that's well described. And let me just point out by one identity that this cutoff here is important. Now that becomes. Here, if you write the problem like this, um, uh, 
because if you want to monitor, if you want, for instance, to understand how how this coefficient uh, behaves, how large it can get, uh, what you would look at is the uh, square of the drift in some point, uh, in the square of the dream stream function in some point x. You take the expectation with respect to your, to your ensemble L, and uh, then by definition of uh, the covariance function, that's the covariance function at the origin, which uh, you can write in terms of the Fourier transform. And then you plug in this expression, and you find that it behaves like epsilon squared times logarithm of L. Exactly. So, uh, so you see that uh, you can do this. You can introduce this stream function as a stationary field only thanks to this uh, large-scale cutoff. But then things uh, look fine. You can apply general homogenization theory, as I will do in a second. But things diverge as you let this scale go to infinity. So therefore, we're still left with the, with the asymptotic problem. So what does stochastic homogenization have to say in this situation? And here I really refer mostly to, uh, to the standard theory. Um, it tells you, it gives you a kind of a nice representation of the effective diffusivity. Let me multiply it with this arbitrary direction uh, as an expectation of something that should be interpreted as a flux. And the flux is taken uh, not just of the average of A, that would be the wrong answer, but it involves uh, what's called the corrector, uh, which is characterized by being the stationary solution of the elliptic equation psi plus red phi is equal to zero, which is normalized to have vanishing expectation. And let me interpret this elliptic equation for you. I mean, for those who have perhaps seen uh, a homogenization periodic or random or general, uh, that will not be so surprising. Uh, for the others, perhaps it's too short. So. This is the gradient of the affine function plus 5x. So what you're doing here is you're, you're taking the affine function in direction of xi, and you're perturbing it in such a way that you get new coordinates uh, in which, uh, which are harmonic, harmonic with respect to your medium, with your Laplace Beltrami operator. So in, in stochastic analysis, uh, these are the coordinates under which your drift diffusion process becomes a martingale. That's the stochastics way of seeing it. And from, for an analytic person, of course, it's not surprising that uh, harmonic coordinates are good coordinates. So these correctors define harmonic coordinates in direction of xi. And if you want to get the effective diffusivity in the direction of xi, you should look at the corresponding flux quantities. So that's exactly what you put here. And uh, so that's general theory. But now the, yeah. So just to dwell on that a bit further. So in the deterministic case with periodicity, there are convection and hence diffusion effects there. Then you would take the cell average. Mm -hmm. You would solve this, uh, you would solve this uh, on the unit cell and you would take the cell average. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially the same spirit and, uh, and you replace the cell average you replace periodicity by stationarity, and you replace the cell average by uh, the ensemble average. That's the translation. Thanks for asking. Okay, so uh, so that's the setup, and now um, uh, now the um, the task at hand is to uh, uh, understand the asymptotics of this lambda of L, right? That's now what we have to understand. I mean, that was the claim which is still uh, still on the blackboard. Uh, 
So uh, it's a little bit like when you do homogenization of metamaterials and you have some small parameters and you want to understand the asymptotics of your effective conductivity uh, elastic moduli or so. Uh, you have the general homogenization setup uh, that's granted. And now the work resides in understanding the asymptotics. So here in this case, understanding the asymptotics uh, as L goes to infinity in this, in this formula. And of course, this is somewhat implicit uh, because you have to solve this, uh, you have to solve this PDE. Okay, so that's uh, the last thing which I want to explain a bit. So in fact, uh, we prove this here by deriving uh, at least approximately an ODE for lambda L. And the ODE for lambda L we derive is uh, this one. Now let me get uh, everything correct. There's factor one half, DL, and then we take exactly this uh, this quantity here, uh, sine squared. And uh, if uh, if you uh, bring the lambda L by Leibniz rule under the DDL, then you have kind of an exact integral. And if you integrate it up and you plug in uh, this formula, you get this result. So uh, it's really this, uh, this ODE uh, that you have to understand or derive. How, in a certain sense, incrementally, how does the effective diffusivity uh, depend on L? So now that becomes... So this is, in a certain sense, where it connects to, uh, but that's a pompous word, uh, to renormalization group ideas. In the end, our, our pep is very short and crisp, uh, is that uh, uh, what this asks you to do is to take in randomness step by step. So, uh, so in a certain sense, looking at this Fourier transform, you add, in a certain sense, in every, we do it in a discrete way. So we go from uh, L to L plus, and we do it in a geometric way, which is important to capture kind of the critical scaling. So M is some factor, some geometric factor, which we use a little bit to fudge things. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so in, in every discrete step, we're adding a dyadic interval of roughness of scales, right? And, uh, and we have to monitor how that increases the effective diffusivity, right? I mean, so we add, we add randomness to the drift, we add kind of longer scales, and we have to understand how that adds to the, uh, uh, to the diffusivity. And the way uh, we do that is as follows. So uh, somewhat pompous way of saying is that we do a variance decomposition, or uh, but that really doesn't mean very different things than writing, introducing a coupling between the different ensembles. So... Uh, so we write uh, psi L plus to be psi L plus the psi prime. That's the increment. So this here is distributed according to uh, the bigger ensemble. This is distributed according to uh, the smaller ensembles. And the important thing is that you can do it in such a way that these two things are independent. That's, that's the variance decomposition, and that makes sure that you have some kind of martingale property in what uh, uh, what happens. And uh, so, what you do, you look at the difference of the two corrector equations, 
So uh, I pre-computed this for you. Uh, so AL is the is this type of coefficient, which is still there. Uh, for the smaller ensemble, that's the difference between the two correctors. And you make an error, which goes like epsilon divergence J uh, psi plus red phi L plus. That's the exact formula which you, uh, uh, which you get. And, um, and sorry, and there is a psi prime here. Thing here. Put an L there. And, uh, and now you'd make only two approximations. One is a linearization, by which I mean that we uh, just kind of uh, retain the term that's linear in epsilon. So we throw out this term. So that means that we replace the right hand side by the simpler expression, which is now Gaussian. And the more important step is we do we perform kind of a scale by scale homogenization, which means we're replacing the left hand side or the solution operator, which comes from the left hand side by uh, the homogenized solution operator. And uh, then this means we end up with a, with a problem that looks much more tractable. And then, of course, one has to estimate the two errors. But let me just write down the tract tractable problem. So if you do these two simplifications, uh, what you uh, uh, what you should what you're uh, in a certain sense asked to do is you you should ask you should solve the following um, by L prime uh, very simple problem which comes from replacing this by this and substitute I mean calling this phi L prime and substituting this operator by the homogenized operator, and then make the ansatz, or, yeah, and then we, you know, hope that uh, the real difference between the larger and the smaller scale uh, is given by this phi L prime. That will not be correct because we're interested in the gradients and experts in homogenization know that if you're interested in the gradients, you cannot take the homogenized solution, but you have to uh, take the two-scale expansion. So, so that's what you have to take. Uh, so uh, phi. Sorry, uh, phi l minus phi l minus is like uh, phi l, but with the general direction replaced by the Cartesian vector e i. E i is the Cartesian unit vector in the i-th direction, and those here are the partial derivatives of this thing. And uh, and now what makes things work is that. This object here is Gaussian, so it's very easy to characterize. And because of this independence structure, I know that these two things are independent statistically. And in fact, what we really do is uh, we define kind of a proxy to a corrector by using this uh, this formula here, where we put the tilde on everything, 
And we show that what we get is close to the true corrector on, uh, on a sufficiently, in a su sufficiently good way. Which essentially is, uh, is this one here. So that's the, uh, that's the, uh, that's the idea of the proof. And it's not, uh, so it's really not, uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very long. And, uh, so I think it, uh, this is a nice example of, uh, of homogenization, uh, homogenization techniques uh, at work in, uh, in such a problem that's interested, interesting to, uh, uh, to people in uh, kind of stochastic analysis or even to some extent mathematical physics. Okay, I think, uh, who was the chairman? Yes, you were the chairman. I was here.